Welcome to a Friday night edition of Navarra Live. I'm Michael Walker. I'm joined by Aaron Bastani. Aaron, how are you doing? Michael, very happy. I'm, I'm very happy to be joining you. Uh, and also, Michael, I've just been sort of paying attention the last few weeks. I, I feel like I, I'm the MVP when it comes to uh, home broadband connection speeds. I always feel like the quality <laughs> of my picture is almost almost on a par with your your face in HD coming from Navarra Towers. Yeah, you're giving 4K from from your living room. I don't know what. Maybe it's a home ownership thing. We'll have to sort out everyone else because this is this should be the standard at which Navarra Media co-hosts plug into the show, as I'm sure all of our viewers will agree. We've got some great stories tonight. We're going to be taking advantage of Aaron's brilliant broadband and talk about a Tory minister who has had a terrible time trying to defend the Conservatives on the NHS and Aaron Bastani managing to successfully make the case for rail nationalisation to the right-wingers on GB News. Also, um, the BBC have apologised after giving a combative interview to a former Israeli prime minister. Um, they bottled it. Teachers across England have been on strike this week, walking out on Wednesday and again today. Today is the seventh nationwide strike day by teachers since February. Most state school teachers in England received only a 5% pay rise for the academic year 2022 to 2023. That's well below inflation. The government also offered a one-off £1,000 payment, but that deal was rejected by all four unions involved in the disputes. There wasn't a single union that was impressed by that offer. Um, the background to teacher disquiet is a decade of pay cuts. Teacher pay has fallen by 10% since 2012. The fall is slightly higher for classroom teachers and slightly lower for head teachers. So classroom teachers have lost out the most. That's, of course, a massive long-term fall. There is, however, a suggestion that an agreement could be reached over pay for the next academic year. The government's independent pay review body is thought to have suggested a 6.5% pay rise for teachers. The Joint General Secretary of the National Education Union, Mary Boosted, was asked on Radio 4 if that would be acceptable to her members. I think members would accept 6.5% with one major, uh, major um, addition, which is that it would have to be funded. Schools don't have the money to pay teachers and leaders 6.5% now, so uh, the, 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 we calculate that there would need to be um, uh, a 3% extra on average funding for schools in order to do that. But if uh, we say to the government, you had the SDRB report for months, uh, publish its findings. We believe the 6.5% is credible. If that is the case, it would be the biggest award announced by a pay review body. Uh, we think that that is deserved for teachers, so they should publish it. Mm. If it is 6.5%, they should pay it. And they should fund schools to be able to pay teachers at yeah. that amount. So Mary Boosted thinks teachers would likely accept 6.5% on the caveat, and this is important, that the increase wouldn't have to come out of existing school budgets. Teachers don't want to get paid more at the expense of equipment for, for students and the like. Um, the government, though, hasn't even accepted the 6.5%. So let alone say we'll give you 6.5% and it will be new money. They haven't even accepted the 6.5%. So Robert Halfen is an education minister. He spoke to BBC Breakfast. These um, bodies have been recommended, uh, made their recommendations, as always, always happened, and the government uh, uh, then responds. We've got to let's look at what it says, this uh, this report, and uh, the government will respond accordingly. But it's been set up, hasn't it, to review pay? So, so uh, with the word independent in front of it, which has been in dispute, do you do you think that the government should adhere to what it recommends? Because it's there to recommend pay and be out of the system. I think that the government has a very difficult choice. Um, it may take uh, the recommendations of the pay review body, but it's got a very difficult choice because, as I said, we've got to spend billions of pounds helping people with the cost of living getting their energy bills down. The thousands of pounds have gone to families across the country to try and keep energy bills down, for example, and other forms of help to vulnerable uh, people. They've also got to reduce the debt because if we don't reduce the debt, then interest rates go up. Inflation goes up. Inflation is the biggest tax on everyone, including teachers and support staff. So the government has a very difficult road to travel down. Um, but the principle, of course, is to be as fair as possible, given the difficult economic circumstances to teachers and support staff. So a review well body fair, should only be listened well to if you have the money. The as well as being fair to the taxpayer. A review body should only be listened to if you have the money, if the government has the money to... I didn't, I didn't say that. I just say the whole point of a review body is to publish this report and then the government responds with it. Uh, it will respond in the way that it uh, can 
can manage in terms of the very difficult economic situation. So we've heard a lot of government ministers this year say, oh, we, we're we just going to go in line with the pay review body. Often the unions have been disappointed at that because, for example, with the nurses, the pay review body decided um, what they thought was a credible offer before the huge wave of inflation hit. So the nurses were sort of fighting for something higher. What you kept hearing then was the government ministers saying, well, no, there's this independent pay review body. We've got to accept it. Um, now it seems like the independent pay review body has suggested something which is a little bit higher than previous um, offers, and now the government doesn't want to commit to accepting it. Sometimes I wonder here if they're just lowering ex- expectations so they can sort of surprise people when they do the bare minimum and accept the, the independent pay bodies offer, but we will see. Um, for now, I am joined by a striking teacher. Lucy Coleman is a primary school teacher, an NEU rep and a branch secretary. And let's start on that 6.5% issue. Mary Boosted said, but that would be acceptable to her members. You're one of her members, of course. Um, it, it might still be a pay cut, though, if inflation doesn't go down. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is still a pay cut. And um, I think I would have to think very carefully myself whether 6.5% was adequate given the, the level of inflation. But as Mary said, it, it really does depend on whether it's funded because schools' budgets are already um, so derisory that we you know we are losing support staff we don't we can't afford resources and so in terms of the 6.5 percent firstly I would have to think whether I personally could accept that but also I would need to listen to my members as a rep and as a branch secretary whether they feel that 6.5 percent is adequate. And you're on your seventh strike day of the year, I think eighth if you sort of count certain regional strikes that have taken place across the country that's quite a lot of days um, what's the sort of um, feeling, I suppose, within the union among teachers? Is there, are there any divides emerging within schools or are people pretty united that this is still the way to go? So uh, teachers are still very angry about the situation and really disappointed, actually, that we haven't received an offer and that the STRB is still not published. I mean, I feel that would be a good starting point for negotiation. However, if they're not willing to release the STRB, then we can't even begin to negotiate. So it's a bit of a moot point at the moment. Um, But in terms of after the the, the strike action that we have taken so far this year, the, the level of support that we've received from parents and the wider community has been really overwhelming. And I was on the picket line on Wednesday and this morning and parents were stopping to have a chat. They, you know, we were giving out stickers to the children and leaflets to the parents and everybody was really supportive. And they are fighting the fight with us because they understand that we're doing this for the children and the students. We're, you know, a pay rise is massively important, but actually the funding is the issue that keeps us out on strike and, and brings us to the picket line again and again. Just to clarify, actually, because this can be a bit confusing. So what Mary Booster was talking there about what she was being asked about on Radio 4 was next year's pay deal. So the pay deal for 2023, 2024. You're at the moment, of course, striking over the pay deal for 2022, 2023. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, we still haven't accepted the, the pay offer for this academic year. So I think even if the the government were to say that they're going to accept the SDRB recommendations for 6.5%, I think definitely as a local branch we've already had discussions that we would be saying well what about this year and the the pay offer that we rejected already back in March you know the the additional thousand pound where's that are we are we still going to get that I think we need to have those discussions too. And looking a bit further into the future Labour this week um, so Bridget Phillipson and Keir Starmer sort of put forward their fifth mission which all concerned education they want to smash the class ceiling. Um, what did you make of it? Was any of it sort of you thinking, yes, we're going to have a Labour government soon, everything's going to be better, or were you disappointed? I mean, what did you what did you make of of the pledges they made? And um, so for me, um, I mean, I think a lot of the the uh, announcements about the broad curriculum th- those are things that are really important to me as a primary school teacher. I I understand that the curriculum has been narrowed so much that we fail so many students. So the promise of a broader curriculum, if Labour are able to deliver that, is is really um, promising for us. Um, But actually, you know, there there are wider issues in terms of Ofsted and the, the outrage that teachers have felt over the last 
few months over Ofsted. And I think we, you know, Labour need to be more certain about how they're going to address those issues. And the, you know, the idea of um, changing the assessment system, the, the NEU have had an independent review of primary assessment. And I think that if Labour are really going to listen to educators and change things and make things different, then, then you know, let's see. It, it will be interesting to see what comes out of these promises. From a personal professional perspective, what we hear about a lot is that retention is the big issue in schools. I mean, what's that like in the school you work in? Are people leaving in droves or are sort of people holding on because they're they're committed to the job? I mean, what, what's your impression of this? It's absolutely um, difficult at the moment to stay in teaching and also equally difficult to stay as a support staff member. And we, you know, in my school, I'm in a small primary school, we're losing three teachers and two support staff members in July. And it's been really difficult to replace those those committed members of staff who have been with us for a long time. And I know personally teachers who have left the profession completely. And it, you know, it, it the workload situation, as well as the pay and the funding, is also hugely impactful on why so many people are leaving the profession. Lucy Coleman, thank you so much and solidarity to you and all of your colleagues out on strike. There's actually an update on this. Um, So just as we were going live, ITV have released a story saying that the education secretary, Gillian Keegan, um, she is fighting apparently for teachers to be given 6.5%. So what the what the pay review body is suggesting Um, she has, you know, in charge of the relationships with teachers, presumably thinks it would be, you know, pretty unreasonable and unforgivable to not go in line with the with the review body. But I am guessing and um, the reason she is having to fight for it is because Rishi Sunak and the Treasury are suggesting no 6.5% would be too much. Aaron, very quickly your views on this this breaking news. Gillian Keegan is fighting for 6.5%. Um, what do you think of sort of my suggestion that maybe this is just them lowering expectations? So they, they sort of make it seem as if like, oh, we might not do 6.5, we might not do 6.5. And then they can have a good news story where they sort of pull it out of the hat and say, oh, we will go along with the review body. I think that's spot on, Michael. Oh, we've done the impossible. We've given you a pay rise below inflation. They said it couldn't happen, but you're only getting one or two percent poorer in real terms this year. We uh, we we pulled the real rabbit out of a hat there. I mean, I think that's, that sort of sums it up, right? It's not like the independent pay review said a pay rise of, of say, 10 percent which would be, be broadly in line with inflation, you know, not right now, but of course you've had higher inflation earlier on in the year. We've got further interest rate rises coming, which is going to feed through to things like mortgages and to rent. So, I mean, Christ, Michael, this should be the bare minimum. And it should be said, teachers are an immensely powerful uh, profession, uh, heavily unionized, high density, increasingly radicalized, has support really from mainstream parts of public opinion, uh, increasingly conspicuous in the media, Again, it's a bit like nurses for me, low-hanging fruit. I think a sensible Tory government that wants to have a chance of even keeping most of their seats in the next general election uh, would do this. So it seems like it seems like an obvious step they have to take, merely as a result of political survival. We are run by a government of pantomime villains. New evidence of that is this. So the Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick has demanded that cartoon murals be painted over at a children's asylum centre. Now, apparently the paintings were considered too welcoming for lone children arriving to the UK. The Guardian write this, the Kent Intake Unit is a reception centre for unaccompanied child asylum seekers. Some of the lone children arriving in the UK are as young as nine, the Home, Secre- the home Office sorry, recently disclosed. Jenrick issued the instruction to paint over the mural in April. Now, this is a photo of the murals Jenrick took umbrage with. So you can see Mickey and Minnie Mouse on the wall in the foreground, and then Tom and Jerry are on the wall to the left. Um, so this is what Jenrick saw and thought, this is disgraceful. This is way too welcoming. We want to make this place really, really horrible for nine-year-old children. Shadow Immigration Minister Stephen Kinnock said this... The idea that painting over murals and removing entertainment for unaccompanied children in immigration centres will somehow stop the boats is utterly absurd. This is a sign of a chaotic government in crisis whose failing approach means all they have left is tough talk and cruel and callous policies. We need a Labour government and our five-point plan to end the dangerous crossings, defeat the criminal smuggler gangs and end hotel use by clearing the asylum 
backlog. Charlotte Kahn from the refugee charity Care for Calais um, said this. If Mickey Mouse is too welcoming for ministers, the question is what will they replace him with in order to inflict more fear on traumatised asylum-seeking children? Maleficent, Ursula, maybe even Cruella herself. The real villains in this story tale are Robert Jenrick and the rest of this heartless bunch that call themselves ministers. Aaron, our immigration policy now appears to be demanding that children reception centres for nine-year-olds take down anything that might be remotely reassuring to a young child. And so they're just sort of grim, miserable places. That's going to stop the boats, is it? Well, it's not going to stop the boats, and that's for sure. And clearly it's a stupid thing to do, and it's deeply instructive about the kinds of people we have running the government. They want to make life as miserable as possible, whether it's painting over murals like this or turning uh, our nation's train stations into effectively apple stores. You won't have a ticket station. You'll have to find somebody who's just sort of moping around the, the, the platform with presumably a little lanyard, like when you go and buy an iPhone upgrade in, uh, in Regent Street, for those of you who live in London. And go to the Apple Store. Just uh, FYI, I don't. Uh, but it's 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 of a piece with the kind of country we live in: miserable, grey, unnecessarily horrible, mean. But I also would ask Michael, you know, what's the progressive position here? I mean, I don't think children should be in these kinds of places to start with. Are we now going to see Labour saying, "Oh yeah, we should have minors in immigration processing centres, but they'll be served dinner by somebody dressed up as Pluto"? It just seems sort of strange. So I, I, I would be worried if this became a distraction from the fundamental question, which is why would a minor be in a place like this for a particularly protracted period of time? We don't know if it would be a protracted period of time, but these are unaccompanied minors, right? So there's presumably going to have to be some sort of place where the state puts these people up while they're processing their claim. I mean, I suppose unless you sort of had foster families that just accepted people as soon as they arrived. I mean, if, if they were accompanied minors, you can see how that would be unless you, you wouldn't want to separate them from parents and put them in some, you know, reception center. But if they've come alone, then you probably do need something along these lines, no? No, I th and that's the question, Michael. That's the question we should be seeking to answer. What's the humane detention system, particularly for children, right? You know, you're going to have a massive free-for-all with regards to what it looks like between the left, the right, uh, for people over 16 or 18 and that's a that's a very charged, often hyperbolic debate. But I think I think you can have a much more sensible, refined, nuanced discussion in regard to minors. And like I say, I mean, I I I, I think it's a bit strange if the conversation regarding how do we make a minor feel comfortable in this country when they're seeking asylum, if if it you know, is it okay if these these young people stay in these spaces for six months or a year? It's fine as long as the place looks like Disneyland. I mean, I, I find that a little bit odd. I understand why this has captured the public imagination. And I think it's part of a broader and very important conversation about the, about the, the almost seemingly inherent meanness and vileness of the conservatives. Just vile people, vile human beings. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit like you, Michael, here on the, in the Navarra family. You know, I sometimes give the benefit of the doubt to people who I, not even sometimes, most of the time, I give the benefit of the doubt to people who I politically disagree with. But then you see stories like this and you just think, who the hell are these people? If I had a child oh, and, I, and I heard that you were the parent of the, of the child that my child was associating with, I would genuinely be worried about them hanging out at your home because you don't sound like a particularly balanced, well-meaning person. So there's two sides to it. It's hugely symbolic, and I understand, like I say, why it's captured the public imagination. But at the same time, you know, what substantially does a good immigration center, well, they are, these are detention centers for the most part, what do they look like for people who may not be considered adults? No, I think that's reasonably put. And I suppose I think the reason why this is captured imagination is not because people think that this mural is really going to make a huge difference to people's um, well-being, but because it just shows the, the callousness of the, of, of the, the Tories. I suppose sort of the, the banality of evil when it comes to these guys, which is they see a poster that might you know, just put a smile on a child's face. And if that child is a undocumented migrant, that mural has to go. We do not want smiling children here. That seems to be the message from the government here. To mark the 75 year anniversary of the creation of the NHS, BBC Question Time debated the state of the health service. Um, Dale Vince is the entrepreneur who backs both Labour and Just Stop Oil. He made this impassioned intervention. I do have experience of being in A and E, and it was a terrible experience. That the staff were completely overworked, and uh, and and it was an awful thing. And I think that the NHS have been underfunded 
for the last 13 years, undermined by the Conservative government. I think the staff in the NHS have been treated terribly badly. They were heroes in the pandemic. Within 18 months, they became zeros when they wanted a, a, a fair rise in, the, in their wages. I think this government is setting the NHS up to fail. And that if we have another Tory government, <laughs> then maybe we won't have the NHS that we know now or remember in 25 years' time. I think that's possible. And I think privatisation just doesn't work, not just in health, but in water, in energy, in, in rail. Anywhere you look, privatisation... Funding model in, in other European countries, for example, which is what, what Kate is stating, and I'm not advocating for it one way or another. In many instances, their outcomes are much better. Does that persuade you at all? Well, I look at the, the fundamental rationale of privatisation is that private companies... And it's companies, not wholesale, obviously, because there is also state provision too. Is the private companies can do it better with their profit motive. And we've seen that fail in everything. We've seen it fail in water companies with sewage in our rivers and on our beaches. We've seen it fail in energy with record energy bills and bankruptcies and a price cap. We've seen a Conservative government intervene in the energy market and fix the price. It's kind of unheard of. You look at the rail system that we have and our train service. Everywhere that privatisation has been brought in, it's failed. It's, and it will fail in, in health as well. That was Dale Vince explaining how the Tories have trashed the NHS while making a pretty strong argument against privatisation. Also on the panel was Kate Andrews from The Spectator. What is failure if it's not being second to last on the list for saving lives? What is failure if you are ranking at the bottom of the list for saving people from strokes and heart attacks? Don't, don't, don't forget, we're underfunded. The NHS well, is underfunded. I'll come to the funding in just one minute. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that you had a good experience when you went into hospital. That sounds absolutely harrowing. I'm also very... And, and I think one of the reasons this topic's so emotive is, is because we all have our own experiences with healthcare. But if we look at the actual numbers, if you have a heart attack in this country, you fare very poorly. You are... The, the NHS is second to last on that list for healthcare outcomes when it comes to heart attacks. And if we look at funding, we are making a political choice here. We have decided, and I'm not sure why, I'm not sure how this came about, but we have decided that the only ethical way to fund a system is only through taxpayer money. So if you look at only government money, taxpayer money being spent throughout the entirety of the 2010s, even at the height of austerity, in that OECD ranking, the UK was not mediocre, wasn't towards the bottom of the list, it always ranked in the top four countries, along with Scandinavian countries. What's happened to that money? Hasn't gone to the doctors and nurses, hasn't gone to the front line, but crucially, we're making a choice here. These other countries, which do not have privatized systems, France, Germany, Sweden, Belgium, Switzerland, Australia, New Zealand, give me a country that is in the United States, and we can point to it, and we can see that in every case, they have universal access to healthcare. But they're being pragmatic. They're letting the state, the independent, charity, private sectors come together to produce better results. And what is healthcare if we're not getting good results? Now, I don't know what Kate Andrews meant there when she said this taxpayer money isn't going to doctors and nurses. That's obviously where their wages come from. I mean, I've heard her sort of separately say that a different model might be able to pay them more, sort of pointing to the United States and Australia. I'm not sure about that. Um, Andrews, of course, though, she is an ideologue, right? I, I don't really trust her as a health expert. She is someone who wants to slash tax and privatise pretty much everything. So whatever the topic, she'll come out, used to be from the Institute for Economic Affairs, say, well, the answer to this is to privatise it and to lower taxes. It's very much a sort of set position being applied to every public service. She is, though, pointing to some real statistics. So this is from the King's Fund think tanks, one of the most sort of prestigious um, health think tanks in the country. It shows the number of age standardised deaths per 100,000 people from treatable causes. And um, so the UK comes second to last, just above the United States. I would argue that's not really an argument to dump the NHS model, though. Sweden and Denmark both have healthcare, which is provided on a similar model to the NHS, and they perform well. Germany, which is sort of the classic social insurance model, is sixth to last. What the King's Fund themselves conclude is also interesting. So I assume this is sort of where some of those sort of statistics are coming from that Kate Andrews was talking about. But they don't seem to agree with her argument. So the King's Fund say this. There is little evidence that one individual country or model of healthcare system performs better than another across the board. Countries improve healthcare for their populations mainly by reforming their existing model of healthcare 
rather than adopting an alternative. Rather than unwinding the NHS, we should seek to improve it. And there is a lot to learn from other countries when doing so. And in the report, if you read it, the sort of things they're saying we should learn from other countries are sort of these middle range policies, not wholesale reform of the structure, getting a completely different system. They say, oh, it might be the case that they do outpatient appointments well in Norway, for example. So saying just piecemeal, we should be learning things instead of saying, well, let's completely transform the whole thing wholesale. Enough of the wonkery, though. Let's look at something a bit more ridiculous. It's this intervention from Minister for Veterans Affairs, Johnny Mercer. It's obviously an incredibly emotive subject, right? And everyone accepts that. You say, do we go into A&E? Yeah, I had a 13-hour stay in A&E this time last year, and it's an incredibly challenging environment. But this idea that the healthcare system is on its knees, if you bear this in context, maybe... A in Somalia, the healthcare system's on its knees. Not in the UK. This lady here has just talked about her amazing experience. Now, are and that lady back there talked about her far less than amazing experience. Yes. So you, you know, you can take your pick. Well, not. I don't know what the lady was was talking about. She was talking about, about A and E condition, but we talked about uh, a heart attack here uh, and something that, that was life threatening. Had a had a had a very good experience of the A and E uh, system. You go to some GPs. Yes, you, you know, it, you you will struggle sometimes to see a GP because of the amount of work they've got coming in and the incredible rocket in usage of health services. Yes, that is true. But generally speaking, if you have to see a GP that day, you will go and see us. And I've been around all the surgeries in Plymouth to, to, uh, to make sure that that's the case. So this is where we've got to. We used to have governments that sort of said, we have made this public service the gold standard. You know, vote Tory, vote Labour, whoever, and you will get the best health system in the world. Now they say, well, it's not as bad as Somalia. Now, no disrespect to, to Somalia or Somalians living in Somalia, but that is, I think, the fourth poorest country in the world. So their GDP per capita, £1,300. Of course, our GDP per capita, 30 to 40 grand. I need to check, but it's a lot more, right? So we are now saying, well, it's a lot better than one of the poorest countries in the world. Now, should we really be comparing our healthcare system to Somalia's healthcare system? I would say it would make a lot more sense to compare it to France, to Germany, to Japan, all places where they have Lots more doctors, lots more nurses, lots more beds, and they have much better health outcomes. Aaron, what did you make of that? Is that going to be the new slogan that the Conservatives use at the next general election? Remember, this is a minister. He's not just some random backbencher. He's a minister. You know, well, vote Tory. It will be better than Somalia. It would be an interesting pitch, wouldn't it, Michael? I have to say, listening to Johnny Mercer last night, I did feel like I was having an aneurysm. Uh, he, he, uh, he didn't make much sense... Uh, across most of the evening, uh, I'll park that because this is a more important conversation around the debate on healthcare. I mean, important to say, Kate Andrews picked some very stunning statistics, but let me pick a few more, Michael, because she comes from the United States. And despite the fact the United States spends almost twice as much as a percentage of its GDP on healthcare, it has a lower life expectancy, higher infant mortality, and more women die in childbirth. In fact, the United States has a greater percentage of women who die in childbirth than Bosnia. It has a lower life expectancy than Cuba, China, and Turkey. So I find it remarkable that an American, a US national, of course, she's more than welcome to come here to the UK. Of course she is. My father's Iranian. I'm very open to immigrants. But I find it remarkable somebody can come from the United States, a country with those kinds of metrics when it comes to its healthcare system, then come to the UK and poo-poo its healthcare system, despite spending far less as a percentage of the economy and actually outperforming the US on the stuff that really matters. Now, people can talk about you know, detection with regards to cancer or heart disease or whatever. The three ones that really matter, let's be real, Classically, when it comes to healthcare, life expectancy, women dying in uh, childbirth, and infant mortality. Those are hugely important things. The US fails on all of them. We pay in this country an average amount of money for an average service. It's just a fact. We pay less as a percentage of GDP than France, than Germany, uh, than uh, the US. But like I say, we actually get considerably better outcomes. And of course, we don't have tens of millions of people who aren't covered and uninsured. So I, you know, the debate really boils down to that, Michael. We spend between a quarter and a third less than places like France and Germany, and our outcomes are, are significantly worse, but not, you know, not astronomically worse. So it really just boils down to the funding. And what I find most remarkable of all, Michael, is we had a benchmark with regards to outstanding performance in the NHS in this country. It was 2010. It was 2010, and I don't need to talk about stats and the OECD and the IMF and the World Bank, you know, all these acronyms that people like Kate Andrews, you know, this little alphabet spaghetti that ruminates in their brain and think tank land. I used it. You used it. We used it. We used the NHS before 2010. It was almost impossible 
to wait more than even an hour or two when you were in A&E. Consultants were remarkably quick. The, the, the caliber of service when it came, came to GP surgeries, phenomenal. So this idea that structurally we have to do X, Y, Z, no, what's changed is the funding. And actually, you did the reforms under Cameron and Lansley. They were a complete disaster. They made things worse. You know, I often criticize Tony Blair and, and New Labour on this show. When it came to funding the NHS, they did a sterling job, partly because they were using the proceeds of economic growth, which one might argue are never going to come back because of this prodigious growth with regards to financialization and the City of London. But regardless, they did pump a massive amount of money into the NHS, and it worked. And people say, oh, it's a bottomless pit. You can't keep on putting money into the NHS. Well, we spend less as a percentage of our economy than France, than Germany. So why shouldn't we? You know, I saw a ridiculous tweet the other day from Christopher Snowden, another one of these sort of ideologues in, in right-wing think tank land, saying that when we started the NHS, just 1% of GDP was being spent on healthcare. This is in the, in the mid to late 1940s, 1%. Well, well, no shit. I mean, the median age was much lower. We had a smaller population. You didn't have things like IVF. You didn't have the expensive procedures we have today. The idea that 10 to 12% of GDP is just unthinkable is, is absurd. And it's going to get more, of course, because we have an aging population. We will spend more money on healthcare over time. And people like Kate Andrews and Christopher Snowden will say, see, look, you spend all my more money. It doesn't work. People are getting older. What do you want to do? You want to uh, make uh, Logan's Run a sort of a basis for national health care and aging policy? I'd rather not. Let's tax the rich. I agree. I suppose the, the interesting question for me is, because we've got a sort of centralized, nationalized health system, what it means is that it is very dependent on what government gets into power. So I totally agree with you. By the end of 13 years of Labour government, the NHS was fantastic. It was working really well. I think anyone who used it would have recognized that. It was still sort of mid-ranking when it came to health outcomes, but that's potentially got quite a lot to do with sort of underlying inequality in society anyway. Um, we know that more unequal societies are going to have worse health outcomes, sort of regardless of of healthcare systems. But I suppose the, 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 the sort of puzzle of the NHS is, are you going to constantly go through this cycle whereby when Labour are in power, it gets sort of systematically better, and then the Tories are in power and it gets systematically worse, and then you just sort of go through this sort of this motion whereby it gets better and worse, better and worse, better and worse. Whereas I suppose one of the advantages of, say, like the German social insurance system is whoever's in power, it gets funded the same because it's, it's somewhat removed from, from government. I think in the Scandinavian countries, which have a, basically an NHS system, they have an NHS system, but it's sort of locally administered. So it's not so dependent on new government gets elected, let's trash the whole thing. So I'm just wondering if you, know, if, if you can think of something that would stop that cycle whilst keeping all of the principles of the NHS. It was suggested to me yesterday, maybe you could sort of have some law where you're mandated to that whatever government is in power, they must fund the NHS this proportion of GDP. Obviously, they could get rid of that law, but maybe it would be a uh, you know, politically difficult to do or a hypothecated tax where sort of people pay the NHS tax and, and there isn't the same sort of revolt to try and bring it down. I mean... What do you think Labour could do, let's say, over the next 13 years, if we're giving them 13 years like they had in 1997, that would mean that the Tories don't just come into power and then run the whole thing down again? Introduce proportional representation. You just said this doesn't happen in Germany. Well, why doesn't it happen in Germany? Because we don't have a polarised system which basically says winner takes all in a two-party two theatre, in a two-party th two performance art, which is basically what we have at Westminster, um, and like you say, it goes from pillar to post. It goes from um, famine to, to plenty. We can't we can't operate like that. And you're you're right to say actually, Michael, it's a big downside with regards to the NHS. I don't think that's a problem with the NHS. I think that's an outgrowth of our constitutional system. You could say that on many many things. We could have a very enlightened piece of drug policy under a Labour government. They're not going to do it right now, but let's just say they did. They could legalise cannabis. And then you have a Tory party, which is very authoritarian, come in and say, no, nope, we're getting rid of all that. You could have a Labour Party which seeks to build loads of, loads of social housing. You could have a Tory party that would come in straight away and go, no, we're going to stop all that. We're going to sell all of it off. So if you want continuity with, with public policy and solving problems and actually building a consensus around the big things and the big issues and how to address them, you need proportional representation. You need proportional representation. This is not some like, and I know that the sort of the real hardcore Labour right people on the Labour right are like, this is just a middle class issue. Think of it technically, please. If you want consensus and you want to establish a broader political economic settlement, which doesn't have this tendency to go from zero to 10 to zero to 10 every decade, like we've had in this country fundamentally since 1979, we have to adopt 
proportional representation. So yes, Germany does it differently. France does it differently. Uh, a bunch of other countries do it differently. The Netherlands and so on. I don't think that's because of our NHS model and the fact that we have really a, you know, a single payer system. In terms of the first past the post, so I think Australia had the best health outcomes there. They've got first past the post. But I've I mean, what, what I'm going to say here is that potentially a bit more devolution helps you out there. I think devolution can have a similar effect to first past the post because often, you know, you, you will end up with a, a, a part of the country that tends to always vote Labour or always vote Conservative and therefore you get the kind of continu continuity that maybe you need for a healthcare system to work. So maybe sort of PR or devolution will get you there to having some stability in, in, in public services and we don't have it at the moment. When Jeremy Corbyn led the Labour Party, the right-wing media presented his nationalisation plans as hard left and extreme. However, after a series of scandals, nationalising rail is back on the agenda, even at GB News. Here's Navarra's own Aaron Bastani making the case against privatisation. The companies are trying to create efficiencies uh, to try and keep train fares down. They're creating efficiencies because they need to give their shareholders dividends. Um, if you look at, for instance, the water companies, we've had privatised water in this country since 1989. Mm. More than £70 billion has been paid in dividends. They've loaded onto themselves £60 billion worth of debt, and yet water bills have increased 50% more than inflation since 1989. It's a similar tale with trains. So, look, if, if we have... Are you going to take me down the nationalisation route? No, no, but look, if they were making these cost savings and they said this will directly benefit the customer, I might not agree with it, but like you say, it's a, it's a trade-off and it's an explicable one. What we have instead is a, a system where, frankly, the consumer is squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and when you have low margins in this industry, and, and rail has always been a relatively low mm, margin industry yeah. anyway... Well, where are you going to get profits from? It's from poorer customer service. And I think we are coming to a place now where we do need that conversation. Should it be in public ownership or, or shouldn't it? I, I tend towards the former, but people who tend towards the latter need to understand the quality of the service will get worse and worse and worse. It's worth pointing out that, that about 60% of the revenue for train companies now is from the government. So it's, it's on life support because of the government, because of the changing ways of, of work patterns. People are working from home and passenger numbers haven't recovered since the pandemic. They're un unlikely to ever do so. And the idea that cutting staff will, will reduce fares is for the birds. It won't. It'll just increase profit. And actually, quite a, a growing proportion of conservative, traditional, patriotic voters are now warming to the idea of public ownership because privatisation has been terrible. Well, do you know, I think I'm one of them, right, when you yeah. say about those people, because I am uh, a capitalist. I do like the whole kind of capital, uh, capitalist mentality and all the rest. I think it's good. I think profit is good. Uh, aspiration is good. But even me, I'm getting to the point these days uh, where I find myself going, well, actually, it is hard for these companies to justify uh, the dividends, the profits and all the rest of it when so many people uh, are in dire straits and their service, quite frankly, is absolutely um, rubbish. I'm trying yeah. to think of a word I could use. Uh, I'm I, I did well <laughs> and I'm proud of myself. My mum will be proud of me watching it. Aaron, GB News is often hostile territory when it comes to the likes of you or I. Um, uh, they didn't need much persuading there. Seems like everyone in the studio thought that privatising the rail was a terrible idea. Stunning, right? Stunning. But I think a lot of people like Michelle Dewsbury is the Michelle Dewsbury rather is the um, is the host. They look at the polling, Michael. And my lesson from being in the media over the years is that people like to be popular, particularly with their base. And I think if you are hosting a show and you know that your base, the people you want to reach, uh, blue collar social conservatives, and then the opinion polls show that fewer than you know 20% of conservative voters think that water companies should be in private ownership. It's not far off that with regards to rail either. When you have clear majorities in support of public ownership with regards to utilities, water, rail, mail, and it's not just with Labour voters, it's not just with the public, but it's with Tories too. And by the way, that's not a youth thing, that's not an old thing. It, it generally is is a sentiment shared across generations, well, then, of course, you want to be popular with your audience. You want to be able to reflect their views. That's, that's part of the shtick. And so I think it's very hard for people like Michelle, or frankly, anyone, even Nigel Farage, to continually, continually champion, advocate, and argue for the private ownership of things like water and rail. And I, I think eventually that will extend to other utilities too. The argument 
for these things is simply non-existent. And I, I'll repeat the numbers I said on that show. We had the privatization of water in 1989. Since then, we've had more than 70 pounds of dividends, 70 billion pounds of dividends paid out to uh, water company shareholders. We've had 60 billion of debt lumbered onto those same companies. So you're looking at circa 130 billion pounds has really gone into the private pocket as a result of that privatization. And at the same time, we've seen water bills outperform inflation by 50% since the late 1980s. And now we have the news coming out from Thames Water last week that because they spent no money or too little money, let's be accurate here, too little money on maintaining and servicing uh, legacy water infrastructure, that next year water bills will have to go up by 40% in order to do the thing that they should have been doing all along, which is ensuring that the infrastructure they inherited is also future-proof. Anybody who doesn't want to be pointed at and mocked will say, yes, this isn't a sensible way to run things. I think with regards to rail, I think Michelle seems to support public ownership. And on water, I, I think she seems to want a, a much more heavily regulated system. But it does get back to this essential point, which I, I did make, which is that things like water, things like rail, are low-margin industries. They're not massively profitable industries. And when you're going to have to invest a ton of money, which you are going to have to do with it with water over the next couple of decades, if you're a private investor, why would you invest money in that industry? Why would you do it? Because you're guaranteed returns. How are you guaranteed returns? Through profits. How are those profits going to be made? Well, it's a low margin industry, so I guess there'll be higher bills. And also, we shouldn't build too much infrastructure. It's just a self-defeating, stupid way to operate public utilities. And then sometimes you get people saying, well, I support private ownership and privatization, but they shouldn't get dividends. Why the hell would somebody invest in it then? Stupid. Let's bring these things back into public ownership. And, and also, let's be realistic that this has been so catastrophically screwed up by you know, successive governments, but starting with Margaret Thatcher and uh, you know, these privateers, these pirates, frankly, that we probably will have to have higher bills. But we're going to have to mitigate that, I th think. And we're going to have to do it in an organized way, which will require public ownership. And like I say, also taxing the rich. Now, I said that previously, that we should tax the rich. People think, oh, God, Aaron just wants to tax the rich, tax the rich. There's lots of money in this country. There is lots of money in this country. And there's lots of tax dodging in this country, too. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. Boots the Chemist I only discovered this recently, Michael. Uh, as a quick anecdote. Boots the Chemist used to be something of a... Uh, a patrician establishment. They used to look after their employees. And not many people know this, but in the 1930s, Boots was the leading working class library in this country. In 1933, 35 million books were taken at Boots the Chemist. And they viewed their company as having a social mission. They had schools, they looked after their employees. An amazing story. Fast forward to today, between 2007 and 2013, Boots didn't pay, or they dodged, 1.1 billion pounds in tax. They're a supplier for the NHS. Obviously, they get a huge amount of money from NHS prescriptions. They systematically overcharge the NHS for little basic things. So a moisturizer that retails for two pounds, there's evidence that they've sold that same moisturizer for hundreds of pounds. Uh, treatments, which you can find elsewhere for 90 pounds, they've sold them to the NHS for thousands of pounds. So What's happened to Boots in the last 100 years really distills and demonstrates everything that's gone wrong in the body politic. And I think we're going to have to turn this around. But really, Michael, we're also going to need a massive cultural shift that if you are wealthy, you're going to have to pay a damn sight more tax. If you're a shareholder, you're going to have to understand that you can't live on the same never-never that you've seen for the last 25 years. And if you think you can make money out of being a landlord and that you can just sit on your ass and it's as good as a job... Well, you've got another thing coming. That's how the world worked for most of the last 100 years, 150 years before the Thatcherite revolution. If we have any sense in this country, we'll go back to the status quo ante. Very well put. Very briefly, I want to talk about, I suppose, the significance of people on GB News being in favor of nationalization, because it's often talked about in political science, this sort of two-dimensional analysis of politics. So you've got on one axis, you've got left and right. And then on the other axis, you've got authoritarian and liberal. And what's often said is that you often get sort of economically left-wing, socially liberal politics and parties. I suppose Corbyn was sort of the classic instantiation of that. You get right-wing economically and socially liberal parties, like maybe David Cameron was that. Right-wing economics and socially authoritarian, maybe Nigel Farage was that. But what you tend to not get in the political sphere, or you, you tend to not get it in the supply of political parties, say, or the supply of politicians, is being economically to the left, but socially authoritarian. 
Now, people say this, this is some big untapped section of the public. Lots of them voted Brexit. Do you think GB News are trying to lean into that? Do you think they're trying to become a sort of socially authoritarian but economically left-wing kind of outfit? Oh, I don't think so, no. Not the, I don't think they want to be economically left-wing, no. But I, I think they know that a big part of their audience is that, for sure. I think there's a big part of their audience, and I think they make a nod to that. I think they're very happy to say, for instance, that you know institutions and political parties on today's modern left don't really reflect the real left, because the real left was like this. But you are right to say that there are many people like that. There are many people like that. And I, I, I think it's something that many people on the left are, are sleeping on. And it's just a reality. You know, we talk about the, the center in this country, you know. I saw Mick Lynch say this actually with Robert Peston. You know, the Labour Party has the right, the left, and the center. There's no such thing as the center. It doesn't exist. It does not exist in this country. When we talk about I'm a centrist, it doesn't mean anything. Because most people in this country, and you don't have to agree with these political positions, but we have a ton of data on it. Most people want to be tougher on law and order. Most people want less migration. And actually, the stats on this are quite remarkable. Even a majority, a plurality rather, of Remain voters want less legal migration. I, I find stunning, but there we go. Um, most people want public ownership of things like water, rail, and mail. So if you're going to talk about the center, that's what it looks like. But if, if somebody advocates those positions as a, as a totality, I wouldn't. But if you did, you would be called up, you know, uh, I don't know what Paul Mason, the red, brown, fascist, socialist thing. Well, you, you can say that. I'm, you know, I'm not, those aren't my politics. I'm not going to argue for those positions. But there's a significant number of people like that. You know, centrist instead means um, low tax, uh, private investment, look after the shareholders, don't really change anything, or, 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 or yeah, don't do this, don't do that. Nobody believes this shit. If you're looking at base rate of interest next year, Michael, and you've got a mortgage, Michael, right now, our audience needs to know this. If you look at the spreads on gilts, people are betting on interest rates, the base rate of interest, the rate at which the Bank of England gives money to private banks, the base rate of interest, presently 5%, they're looking at 7% early next year, right? When you're looking at mortgages going to where we think they may be by early next year, people don't want, you know, some sort of Hillary Clinton style oh, well, actually, we're going to move this incremental tax rate by 0.5%. You'll get an extra two hours of childcare, and then that means that uh, if our accounting is right, we can give a 0.5% cut to corporation tax for six months, and uh, we'll have a new pass for these kinds of... Shut up! Shut up! My mortgage just went up a £1,000 a month. What are you going to do for me? That's the world we're in. I think that the left needs to get alive to that. And I think when it comes to things like public ownership, when it comes to housing crisis, which is no longer constricted to just renters, as we're seeing now, these almost, almost amusing clips of homeowners saying, I'm fucked. It's not amusing, obviously, but it's, it's kind of interesting. They didn't see a housing crisis for 15 years with renters. Now they're paying attention. I think you're going to get big social majorities in favor of policies like public, public ownership of water, rail, building more housing. And by the way, to be fair to Keir Starmer, he's on top of the third one, right? They're taking on NIMBYs in the abstract. I think there's, there's, there is a big chunk of the electorate that thinks in those terms. And um, our job as progressives is to seek converts, not um, identify traitors. And so I personally choose to go on that kind of show because I think there will be people at home watching who instinctively feel that they support something like public ownership of rail or water, but they're not really exposed to the arguments and the numbers and the facts. And that's where journalists come in. That's literally our job to relay the facts, to relay the truth, or at least another, another side of the argument they perhaps haven't heard before. After Israel targeted the Janine refugee camp in the West Bank, the BBC finally gave an Israeli politician a tough interview. This is Anjana Gajil speaking to former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. We're joined now by the former Israeli Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, from Jerusalem. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Good first, to be here, Anjana. First of all, the Israeli military are calling this a military operation, but we now know that young people are being killed, four of them under 18. Is that really what the military set out to do, to kill people between the ages of 16 and 18? Quite the contrary. Actually, all 11 uh, people dead there are militants. Uh, the fact that there's young uh, terrorists that uh, decide to hold arms is their responsibility. Look, at the end of the day, uh, over the past year or so, we've had over 50 Israelis murdered uh, in many cases by terrorists that were sent from Janine camp 
armed, trained, and sent to kill and murder Israelis in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and across Israel. And Jenin has become an epicenter of terror. So we, unfortunately, uh, had to enter the this uh, hornet's nest of terror and uh, neutralize the, the terror. Otherwise, they're going to continue killing us. So in fact, all the Palestinians that were uh, killed are terrorists in this case. Terrorists, but children. The Israeli forces are happy to kill children. You know, it's quite remarkable that you'd say that because they're killing us. Now, if there's a 17-year-old uh, uh, Palestinian that's shooting at your family, Anjana, what, what is he? Under your definition, you are calling them terrorists. The UN are calling them no, children. No, I'm, I'm actually asking you, what would you call a 17-year-old person with a rifle shooting at your family and murdering your own family? How would you define that person? We're not talking about that. The UN That's has exactly defined them as about. children. The UN has defined them as children. And we know that four people between the ages of 16 and 18 have been killed in this targeted attack. Let's not forget it's a targeted attack. The Israeli forces yes, are going but, but and looking these are for terrorists. these people. I, I, I'm missing something. You know, a 17-year-old terrorist can murder civilians. We've had, there's a fundamental difference between what they're doing, which is explicitly and deliberately targeting civilians and what we're doing, which is targeting terrorists. That's exactly the opposite. We're doing the right thing. They're killing civilians. And the fact that you're creating this moral equivalent or even worse, uh, I think it's unacceptable. That was a tough interview, which I think is warranted when speaking to a politician who supports a 50-year-long illegal occupation. But the nature of the questioning meant the BBC would soon find itself under attack, including from the Board of Deputies. So they released this statement. We are appalled by comments made by a BBC presenter during an interview with former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. The comments made, including the charge that Israel forces are happy to kill children when discussing armed terrorists under the age of 18, is simply disgraceful. This is a clear breach of the corporation's own editorial guidelines and we will be contacting the Director General personally to protest in the strongest possible terms. And the BBC buckled. So they've released... This statement. BBC News has received comments and complaints concerning an interview with Naftali Bennett broadcast on the BBC News channel about recent events in the West Bank and Israel. The complaints raised relate to specific interview questions about the deaths of young people in the Jenin refugee camp. Across the BBC's platforms, including our news channel, these events have been covered in an impartial and robust way. The United Nations raised the issue of the impact of the operation in Jenin on children and young people. While this was a legitimate subject to examine in the interview, we apologise that the language used in this line of questioning was not phrased well and was inappropriate. Now, the Palestinian ambassador to the UK has now responded to that apology. Um, so he tweeted this. So far, Israel has killed 35 children this year and 160 Palestinian children are currently in Israeli prisons. Yet the BBC has to apologise for asking about that. And the BBC doesn't have to apologise for describing Palestinians as terrorists. Now, I think that's a really, really good point by the ambassador. We've had him on the show before. Very, very articulate guy. Because in that clip, you know, you might you might say, is the Israel army happy to kill children? You know, is, is somewhat inflammatory? You know, you, you, you might, it's a question, by the way. So often you put questions in inflammatory terms to sort of elicit a response. But so is it inflammatory to just call Palestinians terrorists, right? Which the host also did. And I haven't said I got called up for that. I don't see any apology from the BBC. Now, you might be saying, why is it inflammatory to say these people are terrorists if they um, are militants? And, you know, they, they were found with guns. I, I don't know if they were found with guns, but even if they were militants, let's say. And the reason it's, it's not uncontroversial to call a Palestinian militant a terrorist is because if you are under a legal occupation, then you do have the right to resist that occupation by any means necessary. Right. Still, there's, you know, you can commit war crimes even if you're under occupation, right? So it doesn't give you carte blanche to do anything. But if what you do is you take action against an Israeli soldier, for example, you're going to get called a terrorist by the Israeli government. Um, the BBC might repeat that you're a terrorist, but in international law, it's pretty unclear whether or not you're a terrorist, right? You're, you might be a combatant just as the person you've gone after is a combatant. But, but that goes about passing because I suppose the Palestinians don't have representation in such a way that they can sort of make the BBC change their mind on these kind of things. I mean, what do you make of this, Aaron? Michael, it's a classic example of what's called in public relations the electric fence. And the, the Zionist lobby, that's what it is, there's a lobby, there's an organized lobby with regards to pro-Israel advocacy in the United States. 
you know, APAC. Very clear. It's not a conspiracy theory. We should talk about it very um, clearly and concisely and choose our words, but that's what it is. Uh, they have created a litany of organizations whose entire raison d'etre is to effectively shape media discourse. Now, one way they do this is through, like I say, the electric fence approach to public relations, where they make the costs of covering Israel, Palestine in a certain way, prohibitively high. Now, let me just explain how this works. I actually did a great video about this. People should watch it over on the Navarra Media YouTube channel. Um, there is a book by a gentleman called Nick Davies, Flat Earth News. And here's a, here's a quote from that book. The BBC has been the subject of honest reporting's attention more frequently than most. Now, honest reporting is one of these advocacy organizations. As one source told a Guardian no journalist, Nick Davies, and this is from the book, if the editor of the Today program knows that an item will make the phone ring off the hook, he may think twice about running it. So what you see here, Michael, with regards to this particular case is, like you say, a BBC journalist asking a very robust and fair question. Okay, You've killed people involved in, you know, they're shooting people, right? This is what seems to be the case, who are under 18. Are you happy with that? Perfectly legitimate, fair question. He is entitled to give a robust response. But what you see here instead is we have to raise the costs prohibitively high so no BBC um, journalist, reporter talks in these terms. And you see it with regards to, say, Dua Lipa, or you see it with regards to any celebrity like Mark Ruffalo expressing support for Palestine. If there's even something that people like Honest Reporting uh, can get them on, or we believe in Israel in this country, led, led uh, by a bunch of people, but one of the central people working for them is one Luke Akehurst, who's a very powerful man inside the UK Labour Party. If they can get them on something, they ratchet that dial up so high they, you know, they make such an example of these people. They think, you know what? I, I probably won't. I probably won't comment on Israel again. Another example is with Bella Hadid on on um, on Instagram. She just had the temerity of of making some comments on this stuff. All in. So this is the electric fence, Michael. And and what's really astonishing here is, look, it's one thing to have professional media advocacy organisations like Honest Reporting on this. That's their job. But then you have organizations like the, the Board of Deputies. Now, the Board of Deputies will tell people like you and I, Michael, when we're covering uh, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, they would say it's outrageous that certain people are equating British Jews with Israel. I agree. You shouldn't do that. It's horrific. It's horrendous. And yet we have the British uh, Board of Deputies, whose job is meant to represent um, Jewish opinion in this country. It should be said that the deputies themselves are elected. Uh, and it constantly seeks to shape how the BBC is covering Israel. Now, it seems a bit strange to me and somewhat two-faced to say, you can't conflate British Jews with Israel and its foreign policy or domestic policy choices, but at the same time, we're going to make consistent interventions in how you talk about Israel at the British Broadcasting Corporation. It seems rather odd, doesn't it? So uh, this is an approach I've tried to identify as clearly as I can, and people should see it for what it is. It's very effective, by the way. Let's wrap up there. Before we go, Aaron, um, can you tell us about your downstream this weekend? What, what are you talking about? What's coming out? We are talking about universal basic income with Will Strong. He's the director of autonomy, hugely impressive young guy, hugely impressive organization. We also talk about the four-day week. Autonomy is overseeing trials with regards to both. Hugely exciting. I have some real skepticism and questions, specifically in regards to a UBI. And actually, Will Strong changed my mind on a few things. So if you're curious about those kinds of issues, tune in 6 p.m. on Sunday. It sounds fascinating, especially I, I love interviews where people change their minds. Um, that will be live at 6 p.m. on Sunday. You'll be able to stream that by, I mean, you can follow actually that stream when this one ends. So you'll be taken to that. Um, for now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.